we have seen over the course of these lessons that the often held idea that surrealist art emerges out of a spontaneous eruption of unconscious contents or dream states is an over-romanticized view and for the most part invalid. We often noted that surrealist thought and structure their artworks consciously, though they often affected to work within the Bretonian ideal. We will now look at some of the devices that many Surrealists use to construct their paintings. We can see some of these devices clearly in the work of René Magritte. He began inventing these in the mid-1920s, at the very beginning of the Surrealist movement, and continued using and refining these well into his late works in the 1960s. We will look at eight of his favourite devices, all of which create contradictions that challenge the viewer's perceptions. The Greek chose not to follow the Bretonian agenda, but instead created the style, which today is the best recognised image of Surrealism. His powerful, engaging paintings perhaps shaped Surrealism more than the lofty philosophical ideas of André Breton. Retexturizing was one of Magritte's first devices. We see it in his 1927 painting, The Discovery, where a woman's body is partly retextured as wood grain. Another early work from that same year using this device is his Figures of Night, where cut out human shapes are shown as pieces of the night sky. He returned to using this device in his mature period in the 1950s with Memory of a Journey and memory of a voyage. He seems particularly pleased by the effect of texturing living things as stone. Perhaps his best known work using this petrification of an image is his The Song of the Violet, which is also sometimes called The Two Men. Magritte used cutaways, that is, he depicted the removal of some surface features to reveal something interior, as in his 1926 work, The Face of Genius, and his The Secret Double of around the same year, with the depiction of cowbells, one of Magritte's obsessions of that time, within the head the figure. In the mid-1930s, he created some paintings with a door with a human-shaped cutout. One was entitled The Unexpected Answer, while the other was named The Amorous Vista. As with the cowbells, chess pieces, bowling pins, musical instruments and clouds, which he often incorporated into his paintings, the Greek liked the image of an opening door standing by itself in a landscape, and thus not really serving as a door. Here is his 1927 Scars of Memory and his later work of 1962, The Improvement. Here again, the door does not serve as an opening into another space. A similar device was his doors set in trees. In the late 1920s, 
the Greek became engaged with the idea that an image and its name could easily become disconnected. Thus, in 1927, he painted The Use of Speech and Table, Ocean and Fruit. He then used this device to create some paintings entitled The Interpretation of Dreams. Freud being, of course, one of the influences on the early Bretonian surrealist philosophy. He played with the disjunction of image and label in his well-known painting of 1929, The Treachery of Images. With its text, This is not a pipe. He revisited this in 1966, adding a new twist in that this painting consists of a painting of a pipe at the top left and a painting of a painting of a pipe at the bottom right. He thus introduces a confusion as to which component does the text This is not a pipe refer. He entitled this The Two Mysteries. The device of placing one form onto another is of course very common in Surrealism, but Magritte was one of its primary exponents, and his use is usually straightforward. Thus, the false mirror of 1929 shows the eyeball as a sky with clouds. The human eye mirrors an image of the external world. But he seems here to ask, what if it already had this image within it? Could it then exactly mirror the external world accurately? In The Collective Invention of 1934, he seamlessly fused the lower part of a human body with the upper parts of a fish. One of Magritte's best known works metamorphoses human feet into a pair of boots. He entitled this as The Red Model. His first version was created in 1934. He revisited this in 1935, 1939, and again in 1953. As this is one of his most popular works, it is no surprise that during an exhibition of his work at the Art Institute of Chicago in 2014, the organizers created as a promotion for their event a seven foot high temporary sculpture of this on the beach. Another key work was The Rape of 1934. Here he transformed a woman's face into a naked torso, thus giving a form to the male gaze which may sometimes, while looking at a woman's face, be inwardly visualising her naked, and in a sense be mentally involved in a rape. This became another of his more powerful images. He revisited this painting a number of times. A year later, he instead metamorphosed a young woman's head into a skull, thus creating a dichotomy between vigorous life and death, in a sense a modern version of the 16th and 17th century Vanitas paintings. 1936 saw the painting The Meditation where three lit candles on a beach are transformed into worms or snakes. He revisited this idea in 1937 in The Philosopher's Lamp, adding a further transformation. He metamorphosed leaves into bird forms in his 1942 painting 
natural graces. And again in Treasure Island 2, or a few years later. In 1938, he first created an image of an eagle seen as a mountain ridge. Though entitled The Domain of Arnheim, there is no place by this name. Instead, the title was taken from an Edgar Allan Poe story. He returned to this image a number of times, the 1962 version being perhaps better known. Magritte liked playing with the idea of negative space. In his Plagiary of 1940, the space which should be occupied by the leaves of the potted plant is replaced by an outside scene of a tree in the countryside. His 1942 painting, The Women of Leo Adam, rather subtly shows a painted image of a wall with a sea and sky in the background. It appears that the canvas has been set on fire to expose a backing layer beneath. This in turn is the outline of two women, and this space is filled with the sea and skyscape. The Villiers de l'Ile Adam, the title, was a late 19th century French symbolist writer. He revisited this filling of negative space with a sea and skyscape in high society of 1962 and the Calomania of 1966. The title is playful, having nothing at all to do with the surrealist technique invented by Oscar Dominguez and much used in the late 30s and 40s by Max Ernst. Magritte particularly liked creating his famous bowler-hatted man as a negative space. This use of negative space is linked to the purposive confusion of figure ground. Magritte had created, as early as 1931, the visually confusing depiction of a painting of a painting of a landscape teasing the viewer as to what was real. Here is his The Beautiful Prisoner. He returned often to this image. And only a few years later, he created the best known example of this visual trick, the human condition. In 1935, he reworked this image in two different paintings. The title, The Human Condition, may refer to the fact that it is the human brain and visual system that makes the image he has painted confusing. In 1936, he took this idea a step further in his painting, Key to the Fields. Here he dispensed with the idea of the image painted on a canvas and instead the glass of the window actually bears the image of the distant landscape. We realise this when we see the broken shards below the window. So when we look at the remaining glass in the window, we must see this as not being transparent, but instead as bearing the image, which seamlessly merges with the background. He applied this to his image of the eagle in the mountains in his 1949 painting of the Domain of Arnheim. The late painting of 1964, The Evening Falls, uses the same idea. In 1955, he gave another twist to the painting within a painting set in a window theme in his painting Euclidean Walks. Near the conical roof of the tower in the middle ground 
is linked with the long avenue shown in perspective stretching off to its vanishing point on the horizon. Magritte liked to place unusual objects floating or suspended in the air as if that were their natural situation. Thus, in 1943, two of his bowler-hatted men take a stroll in the clouds in Reconnaissance Without End, followed in 1952 by his well-known Golconda. Apparently the title was suggested by Magritte's poet friend, Louis Scoutonaire, who refers to an ancient centre of diamond mining, so legendary that the name is now synonymous with a great source of wealth. He was drawn to the idea of aerial rocks, as in his paintings of 1958, Clear Ideas, and the rather absurdly titled The Familiar World. A year later, he painted his now iconic The Castle of the Pyrenees. 1964 saw his rather enigmatic Fine realities. The final device of Magritte, which we will here consider, is his rescaling of objects, such as in his 1946 painting, Cut Glass Bath. In 1952, he applied this to an interior in personal volumes, which depicts a strange room with sky clouds on the walls, made even stranger by the inclusion of a massive comb, shaving brush and soap. The same year, he created another of his better known works, The Listening Room. A few years later, he placed a large rock in the same interior space. And in 1960, he depicted an enormously upscaled rose in the same space. He enigmatically entitled this The Tomb of the Wrestlers from a book by Clavel, which he had read in his youth. We have here looked at a few of the devices adopted by René Magritte which came to have such an influence on Serena's painting. We will now look at some other devices used by Salvador Dali. Dali created a number of stylistic elements, though many of these were so personal and idiosyncratic that few later Surrealists thought to copy or use these. Here we are thinking of his use, for example, of the crutch, or his obsessive fear of insects. However, beginning in his earliest Surrealist pieces, he often placed his pictorial events within the particular space or landscape of an expanse of sandy desert or an open wide beach with a low horizon and the sea far out in the background, often with a long range of hills. One of the earliest examples is his 1929 painting, Enigma of Desire. And the great masturbator of the same year. Later, he often used desert scenes, as in Nude in the Desert of 1948. There is even a desert in southwestern Bolivia known as Dali Valley, Valley de Dali, named as such because the landscape resembles that in some of Dali's paintings. Usually, Dali envisaged the space as being filled with intense sunlight 
often casting strong shadows. The implied perspective usually had its vanishing point on the far horizon. Here is his 1934 atavistic vestiges after the rain. Another device he developed early was depicting forms flowing in a smooth, almost liquid manner. Among the earliest of such works is his bather of 1928. Here her body is plastically deformed, almost like wax melting. The best known of his works, The Persistence of Memory, is iconic for its flowing watches, though he had already created an image of a flowing clock a year earlier in his painting Premature Ossification of a Railway Station. Another less well-known painting from 1933-4, Masochistic Instrument, has a violin in a state of flux. Through these flowing forms, Dali often created extended overhanging appendages which he felt needed to be propped up with a crutch. As in the enlarged head in his 1932 painting, The Average Fine and Invisible Harp. Or in Sleep of 1937. In 1929, Dali created his The Invisible Man. Here the figure of a seated man emerges out of a number of diverse components within the perspective space. His legs are suggested by water cascading into a pool. His arm on the left is formed by the statue of a female, his other arm by a column while his face emerges out of a complex of different components. A year later, he created a triple of images, a woman, a horse and a lion, all three of which could be read out of his one complex image, indeed could be simultaneously perceived. One of the best known of these simultaneous images is his 1937 Swans Reflecting Elephants where the three reflected forms of swans swimming on a little watery inlet beside an island with dead tree trunks form images of elephants in the calm water. In 1938 he produced The Apparition of a face and fruit on a dish, another well-known image. He was so taken with this invention that he reused its main components in other paintings at that time. He took such delight in his multiple image that he added yet another layer, that of an Afghan hound, and made the face into a likeness of that of his friend the poet Garcia Lorca. In the 1950s, Dali began to depict three-dimensional forms in a state of becoming deconstructed into small parts. Thus his Raphaelesque head exploded of 1951. His now well-known Galatea of the Spheres continued this idea of breaking an image down here into spherical atoms, which using his optical tricks together presented the overall image. In his drawing, Nuclear Head of an Angel of the same year, 1952, we see the form of the angel's head probably taken from a painting of Raphael, dynamically breaking down into rectangular prisms. 
Shortly after, he applied this device to his most famous painting, creating the disintegration of the persistence of memory. Of course, others among the early surrealists developed similar devices. But here we will rest with the two major artists, Magritte and Dali, who it appears had the greatest influence on the development of the art style. We will follow this up in the next lesson, where we will see examples of these devices in the work of later surrealists.